This last bit of information should be enough for us to understand the main functions of the different subcortical structures. Alright, now that we have an idea of how the cortex is divided, let's consider what happens inside the gray matter to make all of this possible. To get us started on how our knowledge of the cortex came about, I want to first consider some of the different staining techniques that have been developed over time to visualize neurons. In the field of neuroscience, two of the most historically notable staining techniques are the Nissel stain and the Weigert stain. The Nissel stain, developed by Franz Nissel, aims to stain RNA by exploiting the fact that RNA is negatively charged. Now, since most of the RNA is processed at the endoplasmic reticulum and the endoplasmic reticulum is concentrated in the soma or cell body, the Nissel stain ends up staining the cell bodies of the neurons. As a result, if one uses the Nissel stain on the gray matter of the cortex, the result will be the following. As you can see, the cortex is filled with cell bodies of different shapes and sizes. More formally, the study of the cellular properties of the gray matter in the CNS is called cytoarchitecture. The second important staining technique, the Weigert stain, developed by Kalt Weigert, stains myelin sheets, and as a result, it allows to visualize white matter projections in the cortex. The study of the different white matter projections is also known as myeloarchitecture. As you can see, each stain allows you to get different information about the properties of the neurons you are studying. Out of these two stains, the Nissel stain holds a particular importance in neuroscience, as this method was used by a neuropsychiatrist named Corbinian Broadman, who stained different areas of the cortex to categorize them based on the properties of the cell bodies. As a result, the scientist came up with a map called the Broadman map. Now, although the Broadman map has been criticized and has some glaring flaws, the terminology that it brought with it is still widely used in neuroscience, and it offers us a good way to discuss cytoarchitecture. As you can see on the right side, the Broadman map is simply a way to divide the regions of the brain, but instead of doing it based on the different sulci and gyri, or based on the functions like we did, the divisions are based on the cytoarchitectures of the brain. In total, there are 52 divisions, and some of these Broadman regions overlap with our structural and functional divisions, but for the most part, the map organizes the brain in a different way, although, as we will see shortly, it makes sense that there is an overlap between cytoarchitecture and function. An important concept that has been discovered within the field of cytoarchitecture is that the neurons that make up the cortex are arranged in the layered structure. From this, two main types of cortex have been established. The neocortex, which has six cellular layers or laminae, and the allocortex, which has three or four layers. The allocortex can be further subdivided into the archicortex and the paleocortex. Examples of the archicortex can be seen in the hippocampus, and for the paleocortex, it is mostly observed in the piriform cortex. Now, these two images of the different cortex that you see are the direct staining work of Broadman himself. You will notice in the description of the neocortex that the staining comes from an adult human, whereas the allocortex staining comes from the hippocampus of a kangaroo. Regardless, the human brain also has allocortex in the hippocampal region, but it is interesting to see that Broadman apparently worked with kangaroos, which is definitely an unexpected animal to be used for scientific purposes. Now, with the exception of the areas that I have mentioned that are made of allocortex, the rest of the brain is mostly made of neocortex, and for that reason, we will mostly focus on it to build our intuition on the cortex. So, if we take a closer look at the six layers of the neocortex, Although at first glance it might be hard to distinguish the boundaries, you will notice that each layer has its respective differences based on the density, size, and shape of the cells. The first layer of the neocortex, which is situated closest to the skull, is also known as the molecular layer, and it is mostly composed out of scattered neurons, dendrites of neurons that are in the lower layers, and axons that project to these dendrites. The second layer is called the external granular cell layer, and mostly contains dense levels of small spherical neurons. The third layer is called the external pyramidal cell layer and contains pyramidal neurons that progressively get bigger the deeper the layer goes. Then, we arrive at layer 4, the internal granular layer, which is a very important layer because it is the main recipient of sensory input from the thalamus, and as you will see soon, this layer is most prominent in sensory areas. Layer 4 is mostly made out of small spherical neurons called granule cells. The fifth layer, the internal pyramidal layer, also represents an important layer because it contains pyramidal neurons 
that constitute the main output pathway out of the neocortex. In regions that have very prominent layer 5s, like the primary motor area, the pyramidal neurons there can get very big. Finally, the last layer of the neocortex is called the multiform layer, and it is characterized by having a heterogeneous profile of neurons. Due to its proximity with white matter, this layer ends up blending with the incoming or outgoing axons. Now, although the neocortex has six layers everywhere it is represented, the relative size of each layer differs based on the cortical region. This idea is one of the primary considerations Brodman took to make his map. If we consider how the neocortical layers in the primary visual cortex, or Brodman Area 17, compare to the neocortical layers in the primary motor cortex, or Brodman Area 4, you will see that they are strikingly different. The major difference between the two has to do with their layers 4 and 5. As we mentioned earlier, the layer 4 corresponds to the cortical layer that receives most of its inputs from the thalamus. As a result, since the primary visual cortex is a sensory area, it will have a prominent layer 4 to accommodate the input it receives from the thalamus. On the other hand, the primary motor cortex is more concerned with motor output, and so its layer 4 is pretty much non-existent, but its layer 5, which mediates the output, is very large in comparison to the primary visual cortex. One important point of terminology that is used to easily differentiate the type of cortex is whether or not the region has lots of granule cells. Remember that granule cells were located in layer 4, so areas like the primary visual cortex that have very prominent layer 4s will be referred to as granular cortex, whereas areas like the primary motor area that have close to no layer 4 will be referred to as agranular cortex. In other areas that are less specialized in their function and process a more integrative role, the relative cellular layers will be between sensory and motor areas. For example, this is area 5, which, as you can see, has a balanced layer 4 and 5 with respect to the two other areas we've covered. In terms of its function, area 5 is an area of the parietal lobe that is known for its involvement in somatosensory processing and many more complex cognitive functions. Hence, the main takeaway with this brief section on cytoarchitecture is to illustrate that the different properties and organizations of the neurons within the gray matter can help us determine or infer the function of the area that we are studying, which obviously in return helps us better understand the functional units of the brain. Now, obviously from this conversation, we haven't even scratched the surface of what is actually happening in the cortex because there are so many layers of complexity that make the study of the neocortex such an interesting but complex field. Many of the reasons why the study of the gray matter is so complex has to do with the properties of the neurons themselves. If you are familiar with my discussions on the properties of neurons in the central nervous system, you might recall that a fundamental role of the neurons there is to integrate signals from the different inputs they receive via synaptic summation mechanisms. As such, you can imagine that all of the cell bodies that you see on the left receive and give connections to nearby neurons in the horizontal and vertical axis. Some estimations believe that in the cortex, there are 16 billion neurons, so if each neuron produces thousands of synapses, the amount of connections in the brain rapidly becomes an insanely high number. Of course, the connections between the neurons are not done randomly, and there is a structure and a logic, but with the trillions of synapses that there are, the circuit rapidly gets messy, especially that it has to be studied on the micron scale. Another property of neurons that makes the circuit hard to keep track of is the fact that neurons can communicate in many ways through various neurotransmitters and receptors which offers the neurons the capacity to excite, inhibit, and even modulate their postsynaptic partners. Because of that, there exist many different types of neurons that all differ on what signals they send, and even differ on how they receive and interpret a given signal. One last aspect that I want to point out that makes the whole circuit even more complicated is the fact that the strength of the connections between the neurons can change through various mechanisms of plasticity, which again adds another level of complexity. Nevertheless, in future videos, we will revisit the gray matter to explore the models scientists have came up with to describe the different types of neurons, how they assembled, and most importantly, how they end up producing the cognitive functions we are all familiar with. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, 
you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.